you see my victory when all i see is a mountain you see a mountain move and as i walk through the shadow your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh. The battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus is nothing impossible for you. When You go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. In the mighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine. Church, we're just going to take a moment here to thank God for all that he's done for us. Father, here's our heart, and we pray, Father God, that you would just speak to us today what we need to hear, what we need to know. Help us to listen. He is my heart, Lord. He is my heart, Lord. He is my heart, Lord. 
speak what is true. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. displayed for us oh god we thank you for the cross lift it up on calvary's hill we curse your name and even still you bore our shame and pay the cost oh god we thank you for the cross behold the land the story of redemption written on his hands jesus you will reign forever Jesus, you will 
this sacrifice for every sin our Savior died the Lord of life can't be contained our God has risen from the grave oh our God has risen from Yeah. 
morning for your grace and mercy and I just pray father that we would not forget who we are that we are here as your children father that we've come here to worship and adore you because father you deserve nothing less and we pray father this morning that you would make your presence known that you would help us to open our eyes to see you and to feel you father we pray for a blessing on this message that we're about to receive, that you would bless our pastor, you would bless his words, and help us to hear your voice. We thank you, Father, for what you're doing here this morning. Father, that you would just um, help us to know you and see you and love you better. And we thank you for who you are and what you do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've been going through this series, Peace of Mind, 
And it's like, Pastor, why are we going through this series? I'm going to tell you why we're going through this series. Because we're dealing with a subject that's not really dealt with too much in the church today. And the reality is, is that the feedback that I've been getting on this series has been amazing. People are like, man, I needed to hear that, Pastor. I needed to hear that. See, people have a misconception about what expository teaching is. Expository teaching is taking a verse in the Bible and breaking it down and making it applicable. See, if I'm the greatest Bible scholar in the world and I share information with you, but you do not know how to apply it, I did not do my job. We forget that the Bible is living, it's breathing, it's alive. And if I can't take what the Bible is saying and apply it in my life, what good is it? So I have a whole bunch of head knowledge about something that's historical and and all these other things, but if I can't take it and apply it in my life, then why? We need to take what we're given and being able to apply it to make us more in the image of who Christ is. And so we've been dealing with the subject about our minds. God made our minds. We forget that. God made you with all the emotions that you feel, with with the thoughts that that come into our our minds. We we have a a responsibility to be stewards of those thoughts because the mind is the pathway for everything. This is why Peter says... uh, um, Gird up the loins of your minds. I, had, I couldn't remember for a minute. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. In other words, prepare your minds for war, because that's where the war starts. That's Satan's good at getting in our minds. And today we're going to talk about something that is so alive and active in the church today that we've talked about anxiety, we've talked about depression, we've talked about all these things. But this subject today... I think is the biggest subject that we're dealing with in the church. And you're going to be shocked. First off, let me ask you a question. What do you say to yourself when you self-talk? Like I self-talk. Like I'll say, man, D, don't forget to do this. Or D, don't forget to do that. Right? But I want to take it a step further. What do you say when you are over and over and over and over and over again playing a loop in your mind. Let me give you an example. You're out driving and you're in traffic. Are you playing the loop that everybody else driving is an idiot? Look at those idiots. Look at those idiots. Look at those idiots. Yet you're the person who's driving 50 miles an hour down the road in a 25-mile-an-hour zone, right? Right? Or when you get up in the morning, you know, oh, I have so much to do. I just got too much to do. Oh, I'm overwhelmed. And when you get home at night, you've got nothing done. Or are you the type of person when it comes to money, you're always broke. It's always going to be this way. Or if you make a mistake, man, you're a total idiot, man. What did you, why did you do that? What do you say when you talk to yourself, what do you say? Well, why do you ask this question, Pastor? Let me tell you why. What you say to yourself matters more than you could ever imagine. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, I'm reading out of the ESV on this. It tells you this. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. Keep your heart with all vigilance. In other words, guard your heart. Guard it. Because what's in your heart is what is going to come out in your life. What you think affects your heart, church. Psychologists call this the law of cognition. What you think impacts what you believe. Thus, that impacts how you feel which impacts what you're going to do. Be careful what you think. Life is shaped through your thoughts. Author and pastor Dr. Paul David Tripp says something. He says, no one is more influential in your life than you are because no one talks to you more than you do. Think about that. That's a great quote. 
Here's the problem. Some of you are talking yourself into a life that you hate because of what you say, what you think, what you allow in. The title of today's message is Silence Your Negative Thoughts. Let's pray. Father, this morning we're tackling a subject that is going to be very difficult, Lord. But Father, we need to tackle it, man. We need to get rid of this chronic negativity that's in the body of Christ. So Holy Spirit, teach us and equip us and change us today, God. We ask this humbly in Jesus' name. And all the church said... Listen, chronic negativity is widespread through the church today. It's widespread. And it's a massive problem that's poisoning people's hearts and minds. And it's affecting them. And listen, this isn't just a practical problem. What you need to understand is that this is a spiritual problem. It's a spiritual problem. Everything starts with God. I tell you all the time that anything in the physical first has to manifest itself in the spiritual. That's biblical. Two things that I want you to think about this morning as we get into this. Number one is your thoughts have incredible power. Your thoughts have incredible power. And number two, you have incredible power over your thoughts. So although your thoughts are powerful... You have the ability, the incredible ability and power to control your thoughts, to overcome your thoughts. I want to start out in the book of Romans this morning, chapter 8, and I'm going to start in verse 5. This is what it reads. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit... Have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. So Paul says here, he says that those who live according to the flesh, now we're not talking about our skin, rather the Greek word here, right? That word is a kind of an odd word. The word is sarx, right? And it means the things which please us, the things that we crave. This is what we're talking about. So in other words, those who live according to their sinful nature, right? They have their mind set on what is sinful nature and desire. Okay, does that make sense a little bit? Okay. Then he says, those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. So what does this mean? Well, verse 6 sums it up. He says, those governed by the flesh, you're going to die. It's leading you to death. But he says, those governed by the Spirit are going to have life and peace. In other words, you're going to have peace of mind. And so, thinking about what Paul's saying here, there's three things that I want to bring out this morning that we need to draw on. The first one is why negativity is not only hurting you, but it's hurting your family, it's hurting your relationships, and it's hurting your outlook on life. Secondly, I want to help you to identify a specific negativity in your life. We all have them. And the third thing, and most important, is by the power of God's Word, show you How with the help of God, through His Word, empowered by His Spirit, we can change from being negative, right? In other words, that which is bringing death to us, to that which brings life and peace to us. Who here wants peace this morning, man? Who here wants peace of mind? Then right now, right this moment, Get all your preconceived notions about what you think I'm going to say. Get them out of your head and open your ears to the Holy Spirit. He wants to have a conversation with you. Now, another question I have for you is why is chronic negativity so toxic? Why is it so toxic? I mean, what's the big deal? We all have negative biases and stuff. Well, we do have negative biases. But neuroscience shows us this, that negative events imprint on our brains more quickly and linger longer than positive ones. I'll say that again. Negative events imprint on our brains more quickly and linger longer than positive ones. I'll give you an example. Over 40 years ago, 
I was driving home from Santa Rosa. And of course, there's this big accident on the side of the road. And everybody's got to slow down and watch the, look at the accident. Well, as I'm driving by, of course, I'm going to slow down and look. And what I saw inside the car makes me sick to even think about it. I still cannot get that image out of my head. See, you need to be really, real careful about what you want to run to all the time. Because you may run to something that will impact you negatively for the rest of your life. I have to shoot that thought out of my brain. When I was thinking about it this morning, man, I was sick to my stomach. I said, God, that was one of the worst things I've ever experienced and seen. I'll give you another example. You put your heart and soul into something, and you crush it. Man, it was amazing. Whatever it was, it was amazing. You were on fire. People are coming up to you, oh, man, that was awesome. Oh, man, that was awesome. Oh, man, that was awesome. And one person comes to you and criticizes you. Do you focus on the five compliments, six compliments? No, you focus on the criticism. That's what sticks. Why didn't they like it? What was wrong, right? Let me ask you another question. What spreads faster on social media, positive or negative? Right. What gets more clicks on the news app, man? If it bleeds, it leads. That's how, they, that's how the news works. Gorier the better. The scarier the better. Listen, chronic negativity, it does something to us. It sends us into a constant state of fight or flight. Stressful situations, we all encounter them. Now, God designed our brains to release what's called cortisol into the bloodstream. When this cortisol hits us, it suddenly makes us more alert, more focused, more aware. And that's good. Like my snake stories, if I come up and see a rattlesnake, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm in it. Now, I'm focused on that thing. I'm going to get away. I'm going to do. But if I stay in a constant state of where I'm at with the, with the rattlesnake, that's not good. That's not good. Why? Why is it not good? Because chronic negativity always makes us feel like we're in danger. That's what it does. It puts us where we shouldn't be at. And remember what Paul said in Romans 8, 6. He said that those that are governed by the flesh are going to die. It's going to lead to death. But those who are in the spirit are going to have what? Peace of mind. Church, when we focus on the negative, the negative on the news. Oh, man, some of you guys are news junkies. You read too much junk, right? When you hang around negative friends who are always talking negative, when you're in these negative situations, something happens. What begins to happen is we develop what's called these negative neural pathways. The brain has what's called neural pathways, and they can lead to good or they can lead to bad. And when we're constantly trapped in the negativity, constantly trapped in the negativity, then here's what happens. Negativity becomes a habit. Some of you have a habit of being negative because you don't know any other way to live. Listen, I tell you all the time, the news you consume, the shows you watch, the music you enjoy, the social media you spend hours on, the people you spend time around, all create an inner script that directs your life. But we don't look at life that way. Listen, I don't hang around negative people. I, 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 I distance myself. Why? I cannot take it. It's different if you come to me for counsel. But I don't want to hear hours of endless negativity and griping and complaining about everything that's going on. My goodness, this election thing has just spun me out. Everybody's coming to me and asking questions. Let me just put everybody's mind to ease. I don't care if you think the election was stolen, if you think it was a good election, I don't care. Romans chapter 13 says God is the, is the subject who puts authority into authority and power. If it happened, then there's a reason that it happened. Stop stressing over the election. You're just as bad as the world. You're so stressed out over it. I have emails, text messages. I don't care. I voted. I don't care. 
Yes, it impacts me. It might impact my wallet. It might impact me at the gas pump or my food prices. But let me tell you something. I am not going to let it impact me so I'm ineffective as God's spokesperson. Some of you are so negative about this that you, if you came to me and wanted to talk to me about Jesus, I'd tell you, get away from me. We're not, we're not politicians. That's not what we are. We're those who are called to spread the good news and the gospel of Jesus. That's what we're called to do. Try spending more time on that and less on that. You'd be surprised what happens in your life. You'd be surprised. Your thoughts have incredible power, church, but you have power over your thoughts. And so this morning, I want to help you, like I had to help myself, recognize where I'm most prone to negativity. Because like I told you a couple of weeks back, you can't defeat what you can't define. If you can't name it, you can't change it. And this morning, I want to talk to you about four areas, four areas that are, are seriously affecting us in the body of Christ. And I want to see if you can identify which one or ones may be the one you're most prone to. I want to start off with cynicism. Cynicism. What is cynicism? A general distrust distrust for people and their motives. This is the one I struggle with the most. God had to really change my heart on this. The way I grew up and then the job that I had, I was constantly questioning people's motives, constantly wondering, can I trust them? As a pastor, I always wonder, can I trust this person? If I let this person into my life, into my circle, can I trust them, right? Cynicism, right? There's a lot of Christians that battle this this one aspect of negativity. The second one, negative filtering, In other words, seeing what's wrong all the time, overlooking what's good and right. You ever been around the person who will always tell you, man, I went to the concert last night. It was a great show. But here comes the but, right? But the lights, the the, the lights, they could have done better on the lights. Well, then it wasn't a great show. How could it have been great if the lights were a problem? You're constantly, you can give a compliment, but man, you're going to come right back with what what was wrong with it. Assuming assuming the worst every single time. Nothing's ever going to change. The worst possible conclusion, that's what the outcome's going to be. That's negative filtering. The third one, absolute thinking. These people are polarizing. It's all or nothing, black and white. There is no gray. There is no in-between. It's either this or this, and that's how it is. If somebody lets you down, oh, it's all bad, man. That person, that person, that person, right? If somebody makes a mistake, man, they're dumb. They're just dumb. I'm smarter than everybody. I know more than everybody. If you disagree with somebody, what, what happens in society today, they write you off. They cancel you, right? Canceled. Absolute thinking is actually actually a negativity. Blaming. This is a big one. You believe you're always a victim. Your whole life you've been a victim. Always a victim. Always a victim. You don't have any control over anything. Life just happens to you. Can't do anything. Life's never going to change. And you blame everybody else for your situations. This morning, church, if you're finding yourself getting jealous, constantly critical, discontented, assuming the worst, hard on others, hard on yourself, then check it out, man. You have a negative mindset. And God says, I don't want that, man. I want you to change how you think. I want you to get out of the negative pit that you're in, and I want you to change it. Now, the question is, can people really change? Can they really shift? Well, I'm going to share with you something that's pretty fascinating that kind of tripped me out. I think it was MIT. They did this study. They brought in 100 people, 
And, and here's what they did. They said, hey, we're, gonna, we're thinking about starting a new surgical procedure. Now, they put 50 in one group and 50 in another. In the first group of 50, this is how they framed it. They explained the, the procedure, and then they said, and, here, and here's the thing, it's got a 70% success rate. Do you think this is a good or bad idea? Well, what do you think most of them said? It's a good idea. 70%? It's a great idea. In the other group, they said, hey, here's the procedure, blah, blah, blah. He said, they would, and they told him, hey, it's got a 30% failure rate. Anybody catch the math there? It's the same. It's identical. But they asked him, do you think this is a good or bad procedure? And what do you think they said? Bad. So then they gave everybody a break. And then they brought them back in an hour later, and here's what they did. They went to the 70% group where they told them it was successful, and they said, hey, that's great that you think that, that, that this is a great procedure, but we've got to give you the flip side. There's a 30% chance that it will fail. Oh, well, I don't know if that's a good idea then. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. That might not be a good procedure. And to the 30% failure group, they went and said, hey, here's the flip side of that. There's a 70% success rate if they do this procedure. And they were like, wow, yeah, now that changes things. That's great. Listen, it was the same statistic. It was how it was delivered. Those who heard the negative that's what they grasped onto. The negative was what, they, what changed. 30%? I'll take those odds. I'll take those odds. If it's a 30% failure rate, 70% is going to work? Those are pretty good odds. Church, the negative is what we always gravitate to. And our minds sometimes don't even think about the fact that they were saying the very same thing. They weren't saying anything different other than how they presented it. So can someone change their thinking? A hundred percent they can. Yes. But it doesn't happen accidentally, and it doesn't happen naturally. Let me tell you how it happens. It has to happen through a supernatural change through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the way it happens. See, when the Holy Spirit runs our lives, we have a totally different or look on life. The aspect of life is different for us. At least it should be. So how, how do we do this? How do we accomplish this through the Holy Spirit? Well, David shows us what to do. David was hit by an avalanche of negativity, and it's something that we see in 1 Samuel chapter 30. Now, David and his troops had just come back from a battle. When they came back, they discovered that the enemy had come and burned their homes, had taken their wives and children, had stolen everything that they had. And worse off, David's men blamed him for this, and they were plotting to kill him. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 3, it says, When David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. David is in one of the most difficult situations he's ever been in. The very men that he was leading were wanting to kill him. To take him out. I like how the King James Version words verse 6. It says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. See, David knew where to find strength in negative situations. He knew that it came through the Lord. That it came through God's hand. Now, what did David say here to strengthen himself? We don't know. We don't know what he, it doesn't tell us what he did or what he said. But we know what he said in many other times 
we see how he talked to himself through the Word of God. If you look at Psalm 103, perfect example here. Starting in verse 1, it says, Praise the Lord my soul. All my inmost being praise his holy name. Praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things. Now, David is writing this psalm in the midst of what has happened at Ziklag. Listen, David knew that he'd been anointed as king. He was chosen. He was set apart. He had been delivered from many things, from the lion and the bear. He had the faith to fight a giant. He he had been protected from Saul's spears. David knew where to draw his strength from in a negative situation. He writes in Psalm 103, 8, The Lord is compassionate and gracious and slow to anger, abounding in love. Have you heard that verse before? How about this one? But you, Lord, are compassionate and gracious, and a gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Psalm 86, 15. How about this one? The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in love. Where do you think David got this from? Where do you think he got it from? Well, he got it from Exodus 34, 6. Does anybody know what that is? God was going to reveal himself to Moses. And he puts Moses in the cleft of the rock, and he says, no man can look at my face, but I'm going to show you who I am. I'm going to let you see. In Exodus 34, 6, it tells us this, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. This is who God revealed himself to be. Merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Listen, David memorized this verse. It was part of his spirit and soul and mind, and he meditated on it. And when things got bad... He didn't have to go looking for a verse in the Bible. He had a verse in the Bible in his heart. And David took that verse in Exodus 34, 6, and he he built psalms around it. He paraphrased psalms around the thinking of who God is. David was using his greatest tool. You know what his greatest tool was? He was acting like a cow. He's acting like a cow. Can you put a cow up? That right there. He was acting like a cow. What do you mean he's acting like a cow? My buddy Jack, who's up in Idaho, was a dairy guy. He had two dairy farms. One dairy milked about 1,000 cows a day, and the other one about six or 700, right? I learned a lot about cows when I would walk the dairy with him, and I was fascinated by how they did everything. How do you milk 1,000 cows a day? It's an It's an incredible operation. But the funniest thing is that, I don't know if you know how cows eat, but they do something that's called remunerate. Or no, it's ruminate. They ruminate, that's what it is. And it's basically this. They eat whatever it is. Like his cows didn't eat grass, they ate grain and all sorts of stuff. Budweiser would bring them down all the used grain and stuff. And I guess the cows got drunk, I don't know. But anyways, but this is what they do. They chew. Then they swallow. And then after a while, what do they do? They throw it back up like a dog. Throw it up. Then what do they do? They chew it again. And they swallow again. Why do they do that? Because God made them a certain way. He wanted them to get every nutrient out of what they were eating so they could produce good milk. We have to be the same way with God's word. We need to ruminate, ruminate it ruminate. We need to ruminate, okay? You need to take God's word in, and you need to digest it, and you might need to throw it up again, and you might need to chew on it again and digest it. Why? Because we want every bit of the nutrient of God's word to permeate through our bodies. Some of you read a verse, and you forget about it. I'll do my Bible reading this morning, and you read, and then you're done. You don't even think about it the rest of the day. I'd rather you take one verse a day and read it and meditate on it, then try to read the whole Bible in a year. 
Or maybe read and then go back and take a verse and, and take that verse and, and chew on it the rest of the day. Church, the Word of God is what changes us. If we got more of the Word in us and less of social media and less of, less of CNN and Fox News and all this other kind of stuff and all these people trying to bombard you with their take on every single thing that's going on in the world, if you would just focus on God's Word, your life would be a lot less negative. Because some of you, all you do is complain and gripe about everything. And I think, my God, what kind of a life is that? What is in your spirit that makes you that way? And what is it that God wants to uproot out of your spirit so that you can be free and have joy and peace in your lives? Paul writes in Romans 15, 13, he says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, church. He says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. But it says, as you trust him. Do we trust him today? Trust him. Don't trust the government. Don't trust the politicians. Don't trust anybody. Trust God. Right? I'm going to tell you, the Declaration of Independence is not the Bible. It's not the Bible. Okay, so you had godly men who wrote the Declaration of Independence. It still isn't the Bible. They didn't quote the Bible. Right? The Constitution is not the Bible. Church, you got to be in the Word of God. Because when you are, then you will be filled with peace. So that what? You may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of you are not overflowing with the power of the Holy Spirit. You're overflowing with chronic negativity. It's like an oxymoron. You're griping over here all the time, but then you want to try to tell somebody about Jesus. Well, and you're wondering why people aren't coming to Jesus? Well, maybe because they're looking at you going, well, why do I want Jesus if, you, if I don't want to be like that? I want to be full of joy and peace. I already have enough pain in my life. If that's what Jesus brings, I'm good. No, church. God wants us to be free. He wants us to be free. He wants us to take this chronic negativity and lay it at his feet and say, man, I can't do it no more. I don't want to live like this no more, God. I want to be free. I want to be a, ves a vessel of your love and of your will. Look at somebody say uh, right now and say, I want to be different. 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 I want to take off any negativity that's in my life. I want to get it out of my life. I'm not standing up here preaching at you. I'm preaching at myself because I can fall into these negativity traps. Now, I'm going to tell you the fastest way you can get out of this negativity, right? You need to take a negativity fast. What do you mean by that? I mean, you need to take a fast. You need to stop watching the news. You need to get off the social media. You need, you need to stop looking at every YouTube conspiracy thing. Um, you need to get away from your negative friends. And you need to start filling your mind with God's word. Fill your mind with the good news. Listen, my wife and I, if I felt like me and her were getting off a track, she'll tell you. I would tell her, hey, we're, we're cutting off all the electronics. Everything's done. And we would take a 30-day fast from everything. We wouldn't watch TV. We wouldn't do nothing. Oh, pastor, you're being legal. No, I'm being smart. I'm not doing it to be, for a legal standpoint. I'm doing it from a standpoint that spiritually... <laughs> I needed to cleanse my life from the junk that is impacting me every single day. You can't even watch sports without being impacted negatively. So don't tell me, well, sports is, no, it's not. It's a cesspool. It's a cesspool, man. Don't even go there with me. There is nothing holy in the sports world. Nothing. Nothing. So don't fool yourself. Well, I can watch sports. Well, you go ahead. The things you're exposed to in the sports world, think about it. But we don't want to think about it. We don't want to give up our flesh. Church, 
Some of you need to fast, and I'm going to encourage you to fast because it will change your life. It will change your life. Because remember, your thoughts have incredible power, and you have incredible power over your thoughts. So let me give you an example as I close here, and I'll be done here in about two minutes, of things you can do. Like if you're a cynic, like me, man, take things in the Bible and, and, and kind of group it together, kind of paraphrase it to help yourself, like David did. David took 34.6, and he built so much around it. So if you're a cynic, let me give you an example. You can say this. With God's help, I will get rid of all bitterness and skepticism. I choose to believe the best of others and be kind, compassionate, and loving. I will love and forgive others as Jesus has loved and forgiven me. Start, start using that the next time you're going to be cynical and critical about others. Maybe you deal with negative filtering. I talked about the negative filtering. How about this? God, by your power, I take every thought captive and make it obedient to the truth of Christ. Didn't Paul tell us to do that? Take every thought captive? Because you are good. I choose to think on what's good, right, true, helpful, and worthy of praise. Huh? How about that one? How about an absolute thinker? As Jesus loved and accepted me, I will love and accept others. Now, here's what we don't like. Rather than always being right, I'm called to always be loving. Rather than just making a point, I choose to make a difference. In humility, I choose to love others above myself. Ooh, is that ever biblical? Blaming. Ah, God has given me a life and a mind of my own. Stop blaming everybody else. By his grace, I will own my choices. You have made choices that have put you in the position that you're in. It's not the man. It's you. And choose God's best for me. Are you choosing God's best for you this morning? I believe I've been given everything I need to accomplish everything God wants me to do today. In Christ, I will overcome. Start doing that. Start self-talking like that and see what happens in your life. All of a sudden, the things that are blowing you out of the water every second of the day, they don't really matter. They don't really matter. Right? When you're out in traffic and you're calling everybody else an idiot, but you're driving 50 miles an hour over the speed limit, you're going to be like, ah, we're all idiots. You know? It's all good. Church, here's the point. God wants the negativity out of your life. He wants it out of your life. He desires it to be out of your life, but you have to want it out of your life. Church, what we're saying to ourselves, it counts. What have you been saying to yourself? How do you self-talk all the time? That's the key, because I'll end with this again. Your thoughts have incredible power, but you have incredible power over your thoughts. Amen? Lord, thank you for this word this morning, God. We should be the most joyous people on earth, yet we are the crabbiest, nastiest, most critical thinking, upset people that have ever walked this earth, Lord. Jesus, thank you for your example that even when you were dealing with those who were adversarial with you, Lord, you still dealt with them in love. We can't see that in our English language, but the words that are being used in the original language, we see the depth of your love. You were correcting them. You were wanting to have them change their hearts and their minds and their position in things. That's what you want from us, God. You want us to change our position. And so today I pray for my brothers and sisters and myself, Lord, that we would change our position, that we would get out of the chronic negativity that we're in, that we would stop griping and complaining about everything that's going on, that, Lord, we would focus on what our mission is, to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And we can't do that, God, when we're complaining one minute and then trying to tell people about Jesus. It don't work. So God, help us today to reflect on our lives, to really take an, take an in-depth look at our hearts and then give it to you. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, may we live for you, truly live for you. I thank you, God.
for your word. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I thank you, Jesus, for your blood. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you walk with us and you empower us and you gift us and you use us. We're in awe of you this morning, Lord, and that right there should be enough to knock all the negativity off, God. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the church said, amen, amen.